watching. All right, you can take it away. Beautiful. I'm going to set my seven minute timer so I make sure I stop in time too. Um, hello, my name is Angela Thering from Buffalo State University. Thank you for having me. I wanted to share my journey of learning about OER as someone who had a fair amount of early fails and messes and kind of turned off to OER, even though I liked the idea of free content for my students and a lot of the issues that we've been talking about with access um, and the journey I've been on directly related to SUNY's relationship with Carnegie Mellon and OLI. So my title is Instructor Reflections on Taurus and OLI at Carnegie Mellon. Those are their OER tools. Gathering and using data is part of the iterative design process. So I teach in the Department of Higher Ed Administration and Adult Ed. And the courses that I focus on are largely instructional design methods, program planning, uh, teaching people how to work with adult learners. And I'm very interested in helping people access tools that are not very, very expensive and tools that are good. And oh, let me get over here. So in this session, we're talking about practical strategies, gaining familiarity just quick. I threw links in the chat to the websites I'm going to because I didn't trust clicking on them for this. Uh, real world experience of integrating and hopefully inspire people to leverage OER tools to enhance their outcomes, which is the goal. Uh, you know, enhancing our outcomes is always the goal. So just briefly, and I'm gonna keep an eye on my timer here. When I was first introduced to OER, it was mostly conversational and as a panacea for every problem that oh, the book is expensive, use OER. Oh, students are signing up late, oh, use OER. So I didn't know about all the resources we have and how amazing our librarians are at the time. Um, thank you to the previous presenter from Brockport and our OER librarian at Buffalo State, Chris Hulsman, he's amazing. I wasn't aware of these resources, so I was kind of going in without a lot of knowledge. And I found that I was, I the quality of what I was finding was not strong. The reliability was not strong. The time and effort for adoption was a lot, a lot of work. Customization opportunities were limited in gradebook integration issues kind of prevented me from all the way engaging with OER. I'm really too excited to propose a solution to this. And I was really excited when I found a solution to this. So all of us are busy with finding resources and making sure things work well for our students. And we really wanna make sure that these things are taken care of. And a lot of my early experience with OER, for instance, having a linked out resource in an online course was that when I built the course, let's say in January, um, on break, and when students accessed the resource in any given module, the link could die, the title could change. Some OER sources that I was using ignorantly were not particularly reliable, and it caused some issues with, you know, students getting confused in my class. I opened my email from SUNY CPD, thank you, SUNY CPD, and I found out about a learning engineering fellowship through Carnegie Mellon. And I'm just gonna read this section down here. And this is kind of what set me on my journey. Uh, learning engineering, a process and practice that applies the learning sciences using human-centered learning design methodologies and data-informed decision-making to support learners in their development. And this sounded interesting. It was also free. And I applied to it, I was accepted, and it really has set me off on a new journey of data and how OER can be related to data. So the fellowship offered me new perspectives on OER and some solutions. 
it provided an opportunity for me to become a data person. I have been kind of using other people's data for years. And this has given me an opportunity, the OLI tools have given me an opportunity to gather my own data and use it to move forward with adjusting my instruction. And it really kind of pushed me to move beyond my own intuition and experience to change and iterate and grow my courses and to really look at the data. And I'm really excited about that because the data that I can look at for my, my classes has offered me a way to be a little bit more objective and not, um, you know, my own personal bias is minimized with, with being able to look at the data. I did provide these two websites for the OER, SUNY OER services. This is the same thing, different way to access it. We have, SUNY has, free access to OLI coursework at Carnegie Mellon. And it's learning engineering designed, learning outcome designed, human-centered data gathering. These are excellent, excellent resources that I only kind of, I wasn't, I didn't join this fellowship to find them, but I fell upon them and I've been converted to um, OER for lack of a better term quick ideas on actually using them because I am running out of time. I got one minute and 30 seconds. So identify places where OER could be used. Confirm that you have an LTI button for OLI in your Brightspace on your campus. This is actually a really, really big deal. If you want the grade book to go in there, you have to have your LTI button. Plan for data-driven adjustments using AER. Oh, OER. Design a roadmap for effective implementation. So despite the fact that these are brilliantly designed resources, they're reliable, you still need to implement them in your own way and you need to customize them for the learning objectives of your course and what outcomes you're focusing on. So we need to kind of set this up and give it some time, but it's really, really kind of easy and customizable. In addition to that, when you Enter a course, this is for example, American English speaking course. Reminder here, free, free, no cost to SUNY students. Excellent and free are not often a combination we see. So we can customize, pick out sections we want, use the whole class, can kind of do whatever you want with it. And it's very exciting. And I will skip this slide and I will share with you that Another group I'm involved with at OLI at Carnegie Mellon and I are doing a long presentation tomorrow and hope to see you there. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Angela. That was wonderful. I know we have Eric up next. Eric, I'm going to spotlight you. And if you want to go ahead and get your screen shared, I will then start your timer. All right. Looks All good right. to me. Can you, everybody see the slides? Yep. This looks great to me. I'm right, going to go cool. ahead and get your eight minutes starting now. All right, thanks. So um, hi, and thank you for taking the time to attend this lightning session. I'm Eric Kowalik, an instructional designer at Marquette University, and I'll be discussing how the Marquette Library created a series of open educational resources for information literacy instruction. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to share the link to the GitHub site for this project where you can learn more about it and download the modules that will be shown today. The files are free to download, though you will need to have a copy of Articulate Storyline if you want to edit them. The current versions were made with Storyline 360, but older versions can be found in the repository. A uh, little overview of what to expect. So I'll talk a little bit about the background about the program these modules are being used in, describe the development and implementation process, um, explain the process to we went through to decide on how to share the modules, and then some lessons learned and next steps. Uh, real quick, Marquette is a Catholic Jesuit university founded in 1881. If you're not familiar with the Jesuit order, they strive to be number one in all things, including humility. The campus is in beautiful downtown Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and had a 2024 enrollment of 10,908 students, um, 7,233 of whom were undergraduates. Uh, the instruction efforts I'll talk about today take place as part of Marquette's Foundation and Rhetoric program. It's a collaboration between the Marquette University English Department and the libraries that goes back to at least 1980. The nature of the collaboration has varied, but until recent years entailed mostly traditional one-shot instruction and scavenger hunts, 
FIR is taken by almost all incoming freshmen. There are usually around 46 sections of FIR and is by far the biggest instruction client for the library. There's also an opportunity for the library to connect with students and show them the value of the library and its resources. The course provides students their first exposure to academic research and academic writing and is taught mostly by graduate students and adjuncts. In 2013, this collaboration began a new phase with the incorporation of online information literacy modules developed by the libraries. Uh, traditionally, the signature pedagogy for Library Research Day has been a one-shot instruction session in which librarian tries to fit all the information literacy knowledge into either a 50 to 75 minute class session. The one-shot sessions present challenges. You can't always cover everything students need to know. And it can be especially difficult if a librarian has an early session in the unit before students have a topic. Also, there's not a lot of librarian interaction before or after sessions. While students may learn in a one-shot where to find help, getting them to come in for additional help after such short exposure to libraries and their librarian is a challenge. Often librarians end up being a lot like actors in Christopher Guest's film, Waiting for Guffman, in which they anxiously await the arrival of Broadway producer Mark Guffman, who never arrives. In 2012, due to turnover in both the English department and the library, Librarians and instructors took this opportunity to, to reconsider the library instruction format and implement new strategies to improve the teaching and learning of information literacy concepts in the F FIR program. Some of the changes included the creation of a librarian role in the learning management system, which allowed the librarian the same ability as an instructor without being able to assign or view grades. So the librarian could post content, create discussion forums, and review student submitted work and leave feedback. Previously, librarians could select um, sections. So there were times when an instructor would have a different librarian for each of their sections. Um, by assigning librarians to instructors and not sections, librarians could build relationships with their instructors, which allowed, in most cases, more integration of the librarian into the course. We also encourage librarians to seek an embedded librarian model when working with instructors. And then lastly, we developed um, e-learning modules that could be incorporated into the learning management system to allow for flipped instruction or homework activities that would not interfere with class time. In developing the online tutorials, team of librarians focused on threshold concept, which Meyer and Land describe as core concepts that once understood transform perception of a given subject. So for example, the ability to narrow a research topic, to find appropriate sources for your topic, and the ability to correctly cite your sources are some of the threshold concepts for information literacy. The team also reviewed literature on multimedia learning theory and relied heavily on Richard Meyer's work. Initially, the team had planned to develop a kitchen sink module that covered all these topics, but after reviewing the literature, the team decided on developing smaller focused lessons that offered practice opportunities, explanatory feedback, and gave students some control over the experience. Using an iterative design process and paper prototyping, the team spent the late spring and early summer of 2013 developing and testing the original eight tutorials using Articulate Storyline. After a pilot in fall of 2013, these tutorials were offered to the FIR instructors and librarians for use in fall of 2014 instruction. And although eight tutorials were developed, instructors were only encouraged by their librarian to use the Introduction to Academic Research tutorial in their course. To help librarians and instructors better understand how to load the tutorials into the learning management system and what information would be captured, the team developed a website which showed all the tutorials, provided links to demo versions of them, and as well as instructions on how to load the tutorials into the learning management system and view student submitted work. Uh, working with Marquette's business intelligence team, a dashboard restricted to designated library employees was created that contains a variety of filters to allow librarians to filter through the data, including by module type, term, subject, course, name, and date. Student responses to the module interactions can also be viewed via the dashboard. Um, additional information about the development of this dashboard can be found in the URL at the slide. Um, since, the implement, since the modules are launched, we've seen three types of implementations that have been utilized by instructors and librarians. So there's the lone wolf where the, instruct, the instructor just you know, wants to do it their own self. They don't really want the librarian to be involved too much. So they add the modules, um, implement them on their own, either online or face-to-face. -face. There's still the traditional one-shot instruction session, but modules can be used prior to instruction for a flipped session so that the librarian can spend more time in class focusing on higher level um, topics or they can be used during a class visit to kind of make an interactive experience. Uh, the last one is besties. So that, that's where the friend raising between the librarian and the instructor have gone really well. And they're more integrated into the course. They provide feedback on student work and they can visit um, you know, multiple times. Um, in 2014, we presented at a library um, conference and received much positive feedback. So we wanted to figure out how we can share these out. So after looking at a couple different options, we decided to go with GitHub because it has the ability to, it's a software platform to share um, software and have backdated um, content and things like that. 
So we decided to use that to be able to disseminate it a little bit better. Um, lessons learned, uh, consider the license you want to release your OER under. Creative Commons may not be the best choice if your OER is software. What platform will make it the easiest to distribute your OER and allow the community to contribute to the project as well? Uh, the development cycle never ends. Technology and software changes. Ensuring your OER stays current, you need to keep developing it. Uh, since the modules were developed, they've undergone two major revisions. Um, documentation for those who are using, utilizing the modules is vital. If you build it, they will come, does not apply here. Doesn't matter how awesome the software is, the faculty and librarians can't easily use it and assess the student work, adoption will be a challenge. Um, and then well, next steps, finally next steps. So from instructor feedback, there's a strong desire for a rubric to assess the modules, especially the open-ended feedback. Um, we're a small development team. We wanna ensure the modules are accessible to all learners, including those with assistive technology. So we continue to test and improve in this area. And we'd love to have more development partners who could expand on these modules and provide additional feedback to improve on them. Um, thanks again for listening to this lightning talk. And if anyone's interested in learning more, helping um, with some module development, please reach out to me. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Eric. Right on time to 18 seconds to go. All right. Next up on my list, I have Heather. And I thought I just saw you pop in here. Oh, yeah, I'm right. here. Perfect. Good morning. Uh, let me share my slides. Yep. Uh, slideshow. Okay. All right. Does that look good and you can hear me? Yep. Everything looks good. I'm going to go ahead and start your eight minutes. Okay. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm coming to you from the West Coast where it is cloudy today, which is nice to see. Um, I'm going to sort of blaze through. We have our eight minutes. I'm talking about um, sort of more so the open pedagogy side of this um, discussion rather than the OER focus. And this is, uh, I'm going to share with you some material I'm working for an upcoming book chapter that's actually coming out of SUNY as well. Um, a text called Emphasizing a Student-Centered Process. Okay. Um, so learning outcomes, again, we're going to focus on uh, something called the collaborative syllabus, which might be new, um, but it is a practice that reflects open pedagogy. So I'm really going to go through what a collabor collaborative syllabus is, how it can support student learning, um, how we can modify our syllab syllabi based on student feedback, um, and then the potential benefits and challenges of this approach. So when we're thinking about open pedagogy, a lot of times the literature does conflate open pedagogy with OERs specifically. But we know that if we sort of look deeper, there's a lot, there's a lot more facets to open pedagogy. It's much more expansive. It is a wonderful model of learner-centered teaching in which we decenter the instructor and empower our students with more agency. It's also anchored in constructivist but having them really construct that knowledge, really have those aha moments. Um, and it's also, of course, anchored in a strong social justice orientation where we value um, access and inclusivity and diversity. So I like this definition of uh, open pedagogy. Um, it's a site of praxis, a place where theories about learning, teaching, technology, and social justice enter into a conversation with each other and inform the development of educational practices and structures. Okay, so I just sort of set that up as some of our framework here. Um, I also really like this framework provided by Nesembeni and Burgos that they discuss the open educator, which is really they take dimensions of openness and intersect it with the different areas of work that we do as educators in the classroom. And they describe how we can you know, basically create open design, open content, open pedagogy, and open assessment. So these are all different spheres within our work that we can open. Um, and in this presentation, I'm focusing really on dimensions of open design, thinking about course design. And there actually is an area of scholarship and practice that talks about collaborative course design. And so this is an approach to course design in which we can involve our students as collabor collaborators in designing the course. So I'm going to get into more specifically, obviously, the syllabus, which is one way to really actively engage students in thinking about the learning experience that they're about to embark on. 
Um, collaborative, collaborative course design is associated with higher levels of student engagement, perceived learning satisfaction, and professor evaluation. So moving here more specifically into the collaborative syllabus. So in this approach, um, which it is right, very non-traditional, the instructor begins the course not with the final And in really on day one, and I'll go through more specifically how I've been doing this, we open up the syllabus for student feedback. And then the syllabus becomes modified in the first week or so of class to, to integrate student concerns and student interests. Um, so what I'm going to share with you, the context I've been working on, I teach an upper division course. I'm in the Department of Communication, um, and the course is called Social Media for Public Relations. It's an evidence-based uh, social media strategy and planning course, so really looking at how organizations can use social media for PR purposes. It typically has an enrollment of 40 students, majority of seniors. It usually is offered in the spring, so it's right before they're launching um, into their you know, professional lives. And it's obviously a very dynamic subject matter. And even in social media, it's you know very, it's always changing. And so it's a, a challenging course to teach in that respect that our landscape is changing. Okay, so in this process, what do I do? Um, on day one, I begin the course and I present to students what I call a tentative syllabus. And I tell them that I really want to integrate their feedback into the syllabus before I finalize it. So I like to do this. It really fits with this course because, again, it's such a dynamic course. Students are about to graduate. So they've gone through most of you know, their degree, right? They're on the edge of graduation. So they can bring some, some knowledge into what they're hoping to get out of this course. So first we have individual reflection where I ask students individually to reflect on the prompts that I give them. And then I put them in groups and they share their feedback and then together they create one coherent set of recommendations that we then share out with the class at large. So we have that, that really happens on day one of the course. And I should say that I am in a quarter system so we only have 10 weeks. So it, I can't really put too much time you know, devote weeks to this, it happens pretty much in week one. So after that first day, um, I go back, I look through all of their feedback, they hand me an individual feedback, and then I take photos of the larger group discussion, which they typically write on the large post-it that adhere to the wall. So I take all that feedback, I do kind of a quantitative and qualitative analysis, really look to see what are the themes, what are they interested in, um, and then I come back after typically in week two and I share an annotated final syllabus in which I indicate already how the course maybe was designed that responded to their interests and their needs. And then I also indicate where I made changes to their concerns. And then what's great uh, optional is at the end of the quarter, I like to come back to that syllabus to show again how the course responded to their needs and interests. And that creates a nice review framework. We're running out of time here. So just you can really open up your syllabus to, you know, however big you want this activity to be or however contained. So I typically ask students, what are you interested in learning? What would you like to learn? So I get a list of the topics they're interested in. I ask them, you know, about assessments and assignments. What kind of activities and assignments help you learn best? Uh, what's your big question? What do you really want to know about? And then you can sort of, you know, extend this, this with sort of in the immediate aftermath as well as the pandemic. How do you want to meet with me? Would we like to have face-to-face -face office hours, Zoom office hours? You can open up, again, whatever aspects of the course you really are open to modifying for student feedback. And this is all um, influenced by Aiken et al., who's done a lot of work in this area as well. So again, not every element of the syllabus has to be open. I typically open it up to course topics, learning activities, some aspects of the assignment. But of course, you want to make sure you adhere to your pre-established course learning outcomes and sort of things that why students enrolled in the, in the first place. I want to make sure I respect that as well. So this is an example of sort of the group work. Students write it on big post-its on the wall. Um, and I'm running out of time here. What is really great about this activity, I like that it brings students into the conversation and it really centers them in the learning experience and tells them that I want to make sure this course offers value to them and I'm, you know, prioritizing their interests and their concerns as much as I can. Um, and so in conclusion, um, it is, 
but the collaborative syllabus, it's a learner centered activity that does align with the values of open pedagogy, specifically thinking about access and inclusivity. It does set expectations for student involvement, which I really like as well. It does, I think, work better with more senior students who they have to know what they don't know to a certain degree to pull that into the syllabus as well. And I'm out of time, so I will stop there. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to more discussion. Thanks, Heather. All right, next up, I have Chelsea. Chelsea, I see you here. <laughs> All right, perfect. If you want to go ahead and get your screen shared, I'll add the spotlight here. Perfect. This looks great to me. I'm going to go ahead and start your eight minutes. Okay, great. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chelsea Slack, and I am an assistant professor in the Communication and Media Studies Department at Southeastern Louisiana University. We are located in Hammond, Louisiana, which is on the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain. So I actually live, live in New Orleans, and I'm joining you guys from sunny and beautiful New Orleans today. So I'm really going to be approaching this. So I have used my the AI strategies, which I'll be discussing today in classes that have both been focused on OER and classes that haven't been focused on a OER. So the, this, um, especially the AI pedagogies that I'm going to be discussing, they can be used for really any type of class, but they especially lend themselves really well to OER classes just because AI really allows instructors to leverage, you know, and create, you can leverage AI to basically to essentially create materials at scale at a way in a way that you couldn't necessarily before we had access, really easy access to these tools that are available. So I have actually taught uh, now at this point I'm on, I'm teaching, I think my third class that has been either partially or completely focused on the use of AI and learning how to use and leverage AI specifically in a communication field. And so communication is also a field that really lends itself very well to the use of AI, but uh, we have to make sure that our students are really prepared to go out into the work into the workforce and enter the market with these skills and this ability to use AI and especially use AI in a way that is ethical we have we absolutely have to prepare students for the realities of that. Um, so that's one of the really important objectives for today. That's kind of like the background of uh, kind of the background of these both of these objectives at its core is, you know, um, getting everyone to one understand, you know, AI is here, it's not going away. And then two, if we do not specifically address AI literacy in classes like communication classes and English classes, classes that deal with basic information literacy. If we're not addressing the AI skills in those classes, then in that vacuum, students are just going to learn to learn about it anyway, but they're not going to learn about it in the best possible way. So, but so especially that's the most important thing. It's just the AI literacy. It's if we don't teach them, they're still going to learn. They're still going to figure it out. Um, and they're just not going to be learning about things in the most ethical ways. And then especially another thing that we're going to touch on is the issue of explicitly teaching students about the implicit bias that exists within artificial intelligence. And that also can link back to many other conversations and topics that are related in communication, uh, such as, you know, data literacy and things like that, and data collection, data cleaning when you get into higher level courses with students dealing with artificial intelligence. But so it's especially relevant though to those core classes that teach any type of, you know, basic information literacy. So English classes and communication classes. So in my experience, um, in my own department, at my own institution, and then at all, and also other departments that either, you know, I've been a part of um, as a student myself or, you know, just having, you know, friends that work there. I know there's a whole lot of reticence, especially within um, English classes, communication classes, these classes that are already so heavily based upon writing. There's a whole lot of like reticence and people are either, I kind of usually feel like it's either people are either really, you know, scared and they don't want to allow students to use AI at all, 
or the students themselves are really, really scared because they've had some teacher scare the death out of them before. Um, or, you know, they're much more open to, open to it and open to embracing it. So it's here to stay. The reality of the market that students are entering for a litany of fields is that they are going to need these skills. And if they don't have these skills, then they're going to be at a significant disadvantage entering the market. So to do justice by our students across a number of fields, we absolutely have to teach them AI literacy. And like seeing our set heads in the sand is not going to work. And then we have to really emphasize that AI and critical thinking, those two things are not mutually exclusive, AI and critical thinking. AI can be like a partner and you can write and learn alongside AI and critical thinking is still possible. And then also another really important thing is that as an instructor, if you are wanting to explicitly get students to use AI, so something I get students to do in like a communication case studies class is they will have to go, they'll like almost like get into an argument with the AI. They'll have to ask the AI, you know, ask ChatGPT, how would you handle this situation? Then they go back and intentionally poke holes in ChatGPT's solutions and repeatedly ask it, you know, higher level, higher and higher and higher level of questioning uh, to really get into the logic, especially uh, of of, you know, whatever its strategy would be for whatever the given case that I, you know, used AI to create for them to also use AI to analyze, to really get them to understand the shortcomings of AI. So that's another thing that's really important is the only way that students truly understand the shortcomings of AI is that they have to use AI a lot. And the more you use AI, you'll be, uh, this is my experience, is that one, you really, really understand the shortcomings and how stupid AI can be, but then you're also really, really, you know, like you really are excited about all of the possible possibilities and capabilities out there. So, but you do have to scaffold those things. So you're going to have to like, <laughs> obviously to do this in a class, um, you know, you would need to adopt and use AI yourself and really come to learn through that process of prompt writing, how to really get down to the nitty gritty of, you know, whatever it is that you're asking the AI to do. And so um, they're doing that yourself and then also by modeling, and then you have to model that for students, then they are really able to ad adapt, understand how to use it in a very critical way and, in a, and, and also in an ethical way. So once again, we just have to focus on the critical thinking and we have to, the more students use AI, the more they'll understand the things that AI can't do. So the more they are able to understand that, the better they will be able to articulate that in the marketplace in that these are the things I can bring to the table to an employer that you cannot outsource to artificial intelligence. So that's something that's really important. Students need to be able to articulate that. Something that is one of the last things I definitely want to get in here is though, if you are wanting to use, like if you are wanting to adopt and force students to use artificial intelligence, something that you definitely need to build into the class is a discussion about the problems that occur with AI data sets, how there is like implicit bias that's built into the data set that's been built into the algorithm, and then how that can be kind of like a cascading problem, especially when you're using something like ChatGPT that has the capability to, to it is actually learning from its, you know, it's learning from its user as you're using it. So if the user is flawed, then it's, you know, constantly updated data set can be flawed. So that absolutely has to be addressed. And again, you have to tie it back to that conversation about data, especially if you're in a communication class. It makes sense. So ultimately, in the end, the most important thing is to ask, do when, am I wanting students to demonstrate knowledge of the content or am I wanting students to demonstrate a writing skill. If you're wanting them to demonstrate knowledge of the content, then don't get too hung up about them using AI um, because they really can learn a lot from it. All right, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Chelsea. All right, next up on my list, I have Natalia. Natalia, I see you here, perfect, hi. Yes, right. and I have my partners, Judy and Meredith will be perfect. with me. Okay, so sounds good. Let, let us me... get the slides up. Okay, um, oops, start here, and um, Judy is going to kick us off. Sounds good. All right, and your eight minutes starts now. Good day, everyone. My name is Judy Beck. I'm part of this team of myself, Natalia Bowden, Meredith Hallcroft, presenting today on 
um, taking what we learned and building an OER and OEP community of practice at our university, which is the University of South Carolina Aiken. Like um, we, we saw that a lot of folks, of course, since SUNY is hosting this are from SUNY, we are a similar um, system. Um, we have our three regional universities, Aiken, Buford, and up, Upstate, uh, along with four two-year campuses, in addition to the home of the Gamecocks in Columbia, South Carolina. And we have approximately 5,000 students and about 160 faculty members. And so that's the population that we work with at USC Aiken. So our journey started with um, like SUNY Brockport, I think it was, uh, the AACNU Institute on Open Educational Resources. So our team um, was designed based on the best practices for um, implementing OERs in your uh, university. So I am an administrator, I'm Dean of the School of Education. Natalia is with the library where our many and ours at USC Aiken OER um, initiatives kind of began. Um, Mitch Combs is a faculty member. Um, our online learning support person is Meredith Hallcroft. And then always, of course, bringing in your Center for Teaching Excellence, and that was Timothy Lintner. Yeah, so um, so similar to, to SUNY Brockport, I think we were in the same group with them um, last year at the AACNU Institute for Open Educational Resources. And that's when our journey really started. And um, we didn't intend to create a community of practice. That was not part of our original goals as part of the Institute, but there was this kind of trajectory from going from the Institute as, as part of our Institute goals, we had to create a master teaching uh, series certificate, which we implemented last spring. And it was really out of that experience where it became clear that one of the most beneficial things um, was this creation of a community of practice. So the master teacher series that we did, we did in collaboration with the Center for Engaged Teaching and Learning. And as Judy mentioned, our um, one of our team members uh, is the director of that. And the series had these four different sessions over the course of the semester, a very basic introduction to OER and OEP, and then a second um, basic kind of introduction to OER, uh, what they are and what they aren't, how to find them, how to use them in the classroom. And then for the third session, we did focus on open educational practices and specifically focused on implementing non-disposable assignments as an open educational practice. And then for the last session, we did a more advanced OER uh, workshop on adapting and creating OER for your specific course. So for, for each of the sessions, we had one of us team members or a couple of us sort of giving an overview, but then we drew in uh, faculty members who we knew were already using um, OER or were creating OER, and we used them as sort of stories from the field where they shared their experiences. So the attendees at this sessions range from 30 um, down to 10 at our last session, which was right before exams. Um, but considering that we're a pretty small faculty, uh, like Judy mentioned, I felt really good about the numbers of people um, participating. We had wide and good representation across disciplines from sciences to humanities and professional schools as well. And the faculty who attended three of the four sessions received a certificate and were recognized by our chancellor at the evening celebration of excellence at the end of the academic year. So 17 faculty completed the certificate. So they had completed three of the courses. And it really was our process where we identified uh, key individuals to help us build this community of practice. So I will pass it now to Meredith, who will talk more about the community of practice. Thanks for that great information, Nat. I appreciate that. 
So following the great success that we had last year uh, with our workshop series, we wanted to keep that momentum going. And we decided one of the best ways to do that was through a community of practice that began uh, recently in the fall 2024 semester. We initially had 21 faculty members registered um, but as we continued to promote this community of practice, we had an additional 10 faculty members who decided to join. We're meeting monthly in our Center for Engaged Teaching and Learning uh, facility on campus. There's a topic for each section with a little bit of a structure, um, but it is still very casual in a way that it helps faculty members relate to one another, have lots of room for open discussion regarding their teaching practices, especially as how they relate to, to open educational resources. This com community of practice is, is currently trying to identify some advisory committee members who are willing to step up into sort of a leadership role to track OER adoption on our campus to see how our efforts are paying off. In addition to these face-to-face -face meetings, we've also found our Blackboard organization uh, for our community of practice to be highly effective as well. This is a great location for sharing different resources, particularly some that faculty have created in their own courses to share training resources and just to offer a great space again for conversation uh, amongst faculty members in between those face-to-face -face meetings. This really helps keep our faculty involved, even if they, for instance, have a really heavy course load one semester and aren't able to attend many of those monthly meetings in person. We're also trying to expand our community of practice further by doing an online certificate um, in the future. Our goal is to launch that in the spring 2025 semester. Currently, our Office of Online Learning and Support offers some certificate programs to faculty based on other areas of, of interest, and we'd really like to take this opportunity to help faculty become further engaged with OER. We learned that many benefits are coming out of the community of practice already. It provides mutual support for faculty. They're able to learn from each other. They're able to share expertise from a wide variety of disciplines. It provides a slightly more organic and informal uh, atmosphere rather than the structured series or workshops where people can really feel able to express uh, their questions um, in a, you know, that more casual setting. This social aspect also helps fight committee fatigue and makes it sort of a, a great kind of conversational place where people want to come and learn from each other. And finally, we found that it is encouraging innovation, which we're really excited about. So as we uh, as we have come to a close with our you know first year and a half or so working with our OER efforts on our campus, we've uh, landed on three main pieces of advice. First. Don't just look for allies on campus. Instead, find ways to creatively engage them and celebrate their achievements. Um, during our workshop series, we had our ears to the ground and were listening for any faculty members who had been incorporating OER practices into their course and actively tried to, tried to engage them and then tried to recognize them through some of those efforts that Natalia mentioned at the beginning of our presentation. Second, Identify the different strengths, interests, or gifts that team members in the group have and use those, those different strengths to accomplish diverse tasks within the group. And then finally, we encourage you to dream big, start small, but think long-term. We've been really excited about what our group's been able to accomplish, and we'd love to hear from you if you have any questions um, and if there's any way we can help your own OER efforts on your campus. So both Natalia, Judy, as well as myself, we have our emails listed here on the screen and again, would welcome you to, to reach out to us if you'd like to chat further about our OER efforts um, and how we could potentially partner to encourage each other. Thank you for, for listening. We appreciate it. Great, thanks so much. All right, for our last eight minutes, I do have um, our last presenter actually lives in Australia. So the time zone there is quite large. I think it's like 3 a.m. there, their time. So I do have uh, her presentation screen recorded and I will play that for you here. All right. I think everyone can see my screen. Corey, can you see? Okay, perfect. Hello, my name is Nicole Gammy and I'm a senior learning librarian at La Trobe University in Melbourne, Australia. 
Love to be with you in person today, but owing to the time zone difference is a bit of a challenge. So please bear with me as I record my talk so that you can hear a bit about how we created burning issues in the classics. Before I start explaining that particular process, I'd like to make an acknowledgement of country. La Trobe University acknowledges the ongoing connection to land and the unique value, valuable contribution to the uni and broader Australian society of Australian Indigenous peoples. I pay my respects to Indigenous elders past and present and extend this respect to any Indigenous participants joining today or watching the replay later on. So today I'd like to go through and explain why and how we actually put burning issues in classics together and give you some ideas about how you might like to replicate such a project in your neck of the woods. So why even bother in the first place about doing this? I had the opportunity um, as an academic approached me, Rhiannon, who's the subject coordinator for this particular uh, subject that is, is featured in burning issues in the classics, um, about something completely unrelated. So in, her, in order to have a bit of an idea as to what she was asking me about and what the subject was was going to cover, I had a look in the, in the learning management system and through the assessment tasks and some of the course content. While having a look at that, I discovered one of the assessment tasks the students had to complete was a digital project in plain English explaining about um, some issues that have a modern modern context, but have potentially have an ancient history uh, associated with them. So I thought, well, this would be an absolutely fabulous thing to share more broadly, and not for them not to get stuck in the in the learning management system once they're submitted. So I, after answering Rhiannon's question about something completely unrelated, I asked her whether she would be interested in seeing if we could get some of these uh, works published. So after that, we then worked out a process and with my background as an environmental scientist and having worked with landholders and that was very much aware of putting out and th managing these types of projects. And I was keen to avoid any kind of snags, things like um, conflicts of interest or having complaints uh, put together about the process. So in order to manage the conflict of interest, um, the big one being that Rihanna would also be marking these particular assessment tasks is, the students were asked to submit an expression of interest prior to being accepted and also prior to them knowing what marks they got. They needed to get a mark of 75 or greater to be included as part of the project because we wanted to only publish quality items and not just publish everything um, from the cohort itself. So setting that um, process up, what I did is I actually went into class and to explain the opportunity to them. I'd also pre-recorded a, a short three minute video that went onto the learning management system so they could actually see the opportunity that was there. And then I went into class to follow it up and hopefully convince them to do it. The site challenge was we didn't really have a lot of examples in terms of that Latrobe had put together and published to show them what it could look like when it was finished. So I went into the uh, during the class presentation, I also talked about the issue of copyright because there's, with this, if they wanted to use imagery or other things, then copyright could become a challenge. They were encouraged just to put this, um, put their project together at the time, and then we would potentially look at copyright issues a little bit later. But wanted them to be aware if they, even if they weren't going down this to publish in this, or going to publish somewhere else, uh, nothing to stop that they couldn't. Um, that they were aware that there's, there was potential breaches with copyright. Uh, so a few of them got around that way by actually making a podcast out of their content rather than um, putting pictures or anything else associated with it. So after the, um, the expressions of interest were emailed to myself, I didn't share those with Rhiannon until after the marking had been completed. And then I got in touch with the students in relation to the ones that were that had submitted. We were, um, had six brave little souls who were happy to be part of the project, which was fantastic. So once the marks were received, what we got the first step we got them to do in terms of the peer review uh, element was actually to get them to read Rhiannon's comments and then make some tweaks and changes to their projects as a result of that. We also asked them to write them a bit of a bio around um, themselves, just so we had a bit of an idea who they were, because their project alone was not going to explain some of that componentry. And the other thing that we got them to do is write, to write a bit of a reflective piece as to why they chose the topic, because they could actually choose within the parameters of the subject, a topic of their own interest. So that was the first thing that they needed to do. They emailed, then emailed that to me, and we found a second person who could then then reviewed the content again, and provided them with some further feedback um, in terms of to tweak things a little bit, a little bit more, another fresh set of eyes having a look at stuff. 
As part of this process, they also needed to sign an author agreement to allow the e-bureau who was publishing the item to publish the content. They still retained the copyright, but they allowed the e-bureau to publish their works. And then in terms of that, we're hoping it will be released. There's just a few more little tweaks to have happen and then it will be available for uh, general consumption and hoping to get some good feedback and, and some potential interest in from that the book in, in that sort of sense. We're also documenting the process. Um, this is something that's quite achievable for, uh, for others to actually undertake. And as part of the actually the publishing process, Rhiannon wrote a chapter around the context of the, the subject to provide a bit of an idea as to what was coming. Then myself and a few others uh, wrote a con uh, some content around things like um, accessibility, copyright, um, ethics in terms of accessing information and, and those kind of componentry as a sort of a, a bookend to the item. So what we're hoping to do down the track is that we'll, this will be shared and potentially uh, commented on and possibly used by other subjects uh, at the university. So I'm hoping there might be a little bit of interest around uh, the book. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to get in touch. My email address uh, will be provided in the chat along with the link to the book. Hope you enjoy the conference. Um, all the best. And if please, if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. All right. And I have those links for folks. So I'm going to get those pasted in the chat. And I, that was our last session or last presentation in the lightning round. So now we can open it up to questions. If folks in the audience had questions for specific presenters or presentations, um, we can unmute, put them in the chat. We can definitely have time uh, for that until we break for lunch in nine minutes at 1230. Or if we're so hungry, we can also equally go to lunch a little early. I'm not seeing anything come in the chat, but um, if there's anything, now is your chance. Heather put in a plug for a book coming out um, that seems of interest to this group for sure. Um, and I also wanted to put in a plug, um, our first presenter, Angela, talked about the Learning Engineering Fellowship through um, Carnegie Mellon and, uh, and SUNY OER Services. And we will likely be offering that fellowship again in the future. Uh, last year was the pilot. Um, this summer, we offered it again, worked out some kinks and, you know, revised it, and it went pretty well. So we're hoping to offer it. Um, at least once a year. So SUNY folks, keep an eye out for that. All right, Megan, we can probably... Oh, All right. 